Robert Plank Show Episode 223 Design a Life That Results in Wealth with Financial Mentor Todd Tresseter. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Robert Plank Show. This is the Internet Marketing Podcast where we talk about making money, internet marketing, building, growing a business, and we talk to all kinds of entrepreneurs as well about their stories, about their ups and downs, about their huge aha moments and takeaways. And our honored guest today is Todd Tresseter. And Todd has maintained his wealth by remaining an active investor and utilizing statistical and mathematical risk management systems for investing through his website at financialmentor.com. He teaches advanced investing and advanced retirement planning principles. So take the next step beyond conventional financial advice and discover what works, what doesn't, and why based Based on years of proven experience. So, Mr. Todd, welcome to the program. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on the show, Robert. I'm glad that you're on here. So, can you tell us, just so we kind of know where you're coming from, uh, what is what is it that you do and what has you excited uh, most lately? Um, well, I build wealth. And so, I use all three asset classes, real estate, um, business, and paper assets, which is the one that most people are familiar with. They're used to what the broker or advisor can sell them, but I treat all three asset classes as part of your wealth plan. And so I build wealth and I teach wealth building. Awesome. So, so nice and, and simple there, real estate, business, and paper assets. And so uh, when you're, you know, when you're working with people or uh, clients and things like that, I mean, what sort of uh, hangups are you seeing people come across? What's holding people back these days in these areas from getting where they need to be? Oh my gosh, it's huge. I mean, we could spend five podcasts on that question alone. Um, you know, it depends on the person and the situation and the asset class they're pursuing and the strategy they're pursuing. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't even know where to grab that question, where the, where the hangups are. There's personal hangups. There's strategy hangups. Um, there's many, many, many hangups. Okay, fair enough. And so, so, I mean, some people might have sort of that, that inner game problem and where, like, they hold themselves back from making money or maybe they've, uh, they've gotten past that point and then the strategy's bad. So maybe they're, they're sort of, like, shooting themselves in the foot and, and doing the wrong things. And so maybe to, to help us get a good idea, could you sort of tell us uh, about, about your journey and, you know, where, where you started and how you got to where you are now? So I came out of college and I was – I mean, I was broke. Right. I mean, I'd gone into debt while in school. I didn't come, I didn't come from a silver, you know, with a silver spoon in my mouth. I had to earn my way through school, uh, lumbered through. And so I had a passion for financial freedom. I'd spent a lot of time having limitations in my life based on lack of money. And I didn't like it. I saw a lot of my friends at school were doing a lot of cool things like traveling off to Europe for the summer and they had cars. I didn't, they could afford to eat out. I couldn't. You know, I used to cook meals for the fraternity just to pay my house bill. Um, so I worked my way through school and felt a real sense of um, desire for freedom in my life. I have a high value on freedom and it wasn't there. And so, you know, I just said, well, you know, I'm going to have to lead an economic life. If I'm going to lead an economic life, I may as well design it to result in wealth. And it turns out that's a unique thought. I didn't think so at the time. It seemed obvious to me. Um, but you know, everybody's going to have a certain amount of money past their life and they're going to put out life energy to do work and things like that. And I just said, well, I'm going to design mine to result in wealth. And that's, that's where the journey began. Cool. And then, so what kind of things uh, did you build? Where did it go from that point? Well, the obvious place was where everybody else thinks, right? Stocks, bonds, that kind of thing, all the paper asset world. That's where everybody thinks. And that's what I thought too. I made all the same mistakes everybody else makes. And so, I, um, I started in that path, but I did a little different. I went into, as you said in the uh, intro, I went into the hedge fund space. And they weren't even hedge funds back then. They were called private placement partnerships. They were using the old oil and gas partnership legal status. And, you know, I had kind of a different perspective on it. I When I was in college, I had looked at a, an investments textbook, and they showed all these charts with wiggly lines of all these different graphs and things. And I just looked at it and said, well, I can make money off that mathematically. And my investments professor told me, well, no, you can't. Nobody's ever done that. It doesn't work. And that was about all I needed to decide to go out and prove it does work. And it did. Um, nowadays, you've got MIT PhDs and you've got, you know, all kinds of advanced researchers and statistical PhDs and everybody doing the stuff I was doing back then. Um, but fortunately, as it turns out, the simple stuff is what works. And that's what I teach. And so 
um, I still use those methodologies to this day that I developed back then. And, you know, then I branched out and I went into real estate, um, sold all my investment real estate before the bubble burst in 2006, 2007 was when I was selling. And then, um, and now I'm in, in, an internet entrepreneur. So I've cycled through the various asset classes based on valuation and opportunity as they present themselves in the market. So I, you know, I rode the bull market up during the eighties and nineties when I was a hedge fund manager. I sold that in 1998, a little too early, but still about pretty decent timing, all considered. Um, revested and moved over to real estate, rode that bubble up until 2006, 2007. I started liquidating in 2005, was pretty much out by the end of 2006 before the decline uh, when that bubble bursts. And now I'm building my internet based business. Cool. So, I mean, I mean what do you think uh, made made you succeed where others failed like how did you how did you know like what were the right moves to do to ride the wave up and how did you know when it was time to get out when it seems like no one else knew about that well first of all nobody ever really knows right like when i i'll give you an example when i sold first of all i was two years too early on the stock market top right and but right. I, better better early than late in a situation like that but i was two years too early but I could see that valuations made no economic sense whatsoever. That was true as early as 98 and 99. Valuations were just absurd and they had no uh, economic logic to them. So anybody that understood uh, valuation principles and risk management principles would not have been long in the stock market going into 98, 99, uh, which as it turned out turned to, you know, to be too early, but it still worked. Um, and then real estate was the same thing. I mean, valuations just hit absurd levels. So valuation, risk management principles, understanding, having a historical context, and just knowing how markets work. I mean, you know, the there's stories about when the shoe shine boy wants to starts talking about stocks. You know that the market's heady, it's it's frothy. Well, I had an experience. I owned a bunch of apartment buildings, and I had an experience. A tenant moved out, and I would always do exit interviews with the tenants. You know, why are you leaving? And you know, just make sure there's no fundamental problems with the building or whatever. And uh, he said, well, I got a 30-year fixed rate mortgage on a $350,000 house. Now, you got to understand, this guy did not even qualify to rent from me. I mean, he had a horrible credit record. I, I know his credit record because I'm the landlord, right? He had right. a horrible credit record. I only approved him because the market was so promiscuous back then and credit policy was so ridiculous that anybody who could fog a mirror could get a loan. And... And so when this guy finally got the loan and I knew his history and he could, I mean, he wasn't even doing good at making rent with me and the rent was only 600 bucks a month and he had suddenly a 30 year fixed on a $350,000 place. I, I knew it was over. I mean, there was just it, at that point they had gone and given a loan to just about anybody who could, you know, that they could. Um, so it's, it's simple supply and demand. I mean, ultimately there's two principles you know, one of which is mean reversion, you know, so markets will go to extremes and there's great information value at the extremes. And so what I'm doing is I'm sharing with you points that were clear extremes. I'll, I'll bring it to current just to make it relevant for this podcast. We're recording in late 2016, or actually December 2016. And the current extreme or the year this year's extreme is the bond market, right? That's a that's a market that makes no economic sense. It's way past any extreme point in terms of pursuing 0% interest rates. Now, just to be educational on that, that doesn't mean that it's at a final top. You can't run out in short bonds, right? Um, all it means is that the risk reward makes no sense and ultimately it will mean revert. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Okay, so when you're when you're sort of looking at these different, I guess like the the trends or the markets or whatever, and you're trying to decide, well, is is something on its way up or is the bubble about to burst? It sounds like you kind of ha have a blend between uh, these different tools between like the this logic and this emotion stuff like I keep hearing a lot of like will you do the like the, the math and the statistics on like the the charts and graphs and stuff like that and it also sounds like you have some like you're somewhat of a of a have a have a, the right system or the right process in place because you mentioned that uh, when you rented out uh, apartments you had things like an exit interview so you so you had certain sort of I don't know like like these systems in place to, to catch if something was quite wrong and then you also have this element of sort of the the anecdotal uh, story or sort of the the gut check feeling I mean is, is that about right Do you kind of oh you yeah kind of use actually all that was very there? Yeah, no, that, actually, that was very observant of you. Um, 
So, yeah, I believe the investment done right. You know, everybody's always here's another myth for you. Everybody's always looking for the great, a good investment. You know, they want to know what's a good investment. That's inherent. If you look at all the media headlines, you know, five hot stocks for the next year and, you know, five mutual funds that are going to outperform. Right. It's always about offense, not defense. And it's always about uh, finding the next great investment. And that's a flawed premise. When you understand investing at a deeper level, you understand that it's about process, not product. OK, so everybody always wants to look at product, i.e. the next great investment and actually investing done right is a process. And that's what you're observing. You know, running a business properly is a process. Um, obviously, you need a product, but the proper running of the business is a process. Everything operates in terms of systems and processes. OK, th that makes sense. And so um, so. Uh uh, you but have, with that said, you okay. know, let me just cut in for a second. With that said, you also have to have a backdrop to understand what the proper principles are. So you heard me mixing both in my answer, right? So yeah, it's all about process, but then you also have to have underlying sound principles. It doesn't make it doesn't do you any good to have a process if it's built on flawed principles. And so that's where you're hearing me talk about like valuation as a risk management principle. And I was pointing out how extremes in valuation have high information value. So those are valid principles of investing. Right. But right. then you have to have a process to capture that and turn it into a systematic, you know, methodology that is valid, that's valid. So okay. it's both. It's both. Right. And that, and that makes sense. So there's like the, the principles, like the things to know and then the process, like what what those those different steps are. And so, I mean, with all, all these different sort of things we've thrown out there so far, I mean, where does someone even begin? Like if someone says, well, I, you know, I have I have no idea. Uh, you know what what I should be doing if I you know have money saved up what I should be putting it in where I should be growing it how I should be protecting my money uh, like where does someone even if they're like brand new or like saying my old way of thinking was bad let me sort of go back and start from scratch where should someone what should someone be like thinking and looking at well the investment is filled with the start or I'm sorry the internet is filled with the starting point right the starting point is low cost passive index asset allocation. Um, that is a valid investment process. However, it's not efficient. Okay. But it is valid. Okay. And it's proven through extensive research. Um, and so that would be the starting point because it requires the least amount of knowledge and, and it requires zero skill, right? Everything you need to know about low cost passive asset allocation, you could learn in a, in a few paragraphs, but those few paragraphs are stretched out into books. And there's a handful of, you know, good books on the subject, uh, that you can get from Amazon or anywhere for a few bucks. You don't even need to hire a money manager for it. It's that simple. So anyway, low cost passive index asset allocation is a starting point. The problem is there's no risk management in there. And so it's a valid process given sufficient time and discipline. However, it's not an efficient process and it's emotionally very hard to follow as evidenced by the actual results of real world investors practicing it. Um, but that is the starting point. You have to start somewhere. You have to crawl first before you can learn to walk. And then you have to walk before you learn to run. And you have to run before you can wind sprint, right? And so they're all different skill levels. And you can build that expertise up over time. But you have to start somewhere. And that starting point is to understand what's valid, what's true in low cost passive index asset allocation, and what isn't. Because some of the stuff taught in the books is completely true and valid. And other stuff taught in there. Um, other premises or or, uh, or um, belief structures that it's built upon aren't valid. They're, they may be special case situations. Okay, and you keep mentioning this this low cost passive index al asset allocation. And uh, can you explain to me what that is? Because I'm not sure I, I understand. Sure. Anybody wants to understand it, they can. You know, it was popularized. Uh, Vanguard Bogleheads. It's spread throughout the internet. Most of the personal finance bloggers advocate it. Um, again, it is valid. The idea is that you diversify across low cost index funds. So you might use the Barclays bond index and you might use the S&P 500 for stocks, right? And you'd have an asset allocation. Maybe you'd have a little international. So you might have the Morgan Stanley, you know, the MSCI EFA, which is Morgan Stanley, European, Australian, Far, Far East. Um, it, it, you know, so there's like these indexes that characterize certain market characteristics or mar market profiles, and you'd build a portfolio of these low cost passive indexes. The goal is to minimize your costs and to diversify in a low cost way that approximates market returns. The premise is that you can't add value through skill and therefore 
you want to get costs as low as possible and just accept market return and risk. And then eventually market return and risk will result in a positive return. And the reason that's true is the source of return is dividends plus economic growth. In other words, the source of return from a stock portfolio is dividends plus economic growth plus or minus change in market valuation. And so when you have a low cost passive index portfolio, what you do is you accept the third component of the formula, which is plus or minus change in market valuation. You accept that uncontrolled risk in order to eventually receive the dividends plus economic growth, which are remarkably constant over time. And so eventually the two little components at the front, the dividends plus economic growth, eventually overwhelm the large, large changes that occur in the markets, you know, the volatility in the markets resulting in a positive return. And that's why all the low cost passive index people and the buy and hold people will tell you that you have to have a uh, long term perspective, you know, 20 plus years in order to realize a positive return. That's why, because it can take 20 plus years for the first two components of the return equation to overwhelm the third. Okay, so so you're saying with all the all the ups and downs and like the 2000 bubble that burst and the 2008 bubble that burst, there'll be those ups and downs. But but this uh, this sort of beginner step into things, this is this is the buy and hold game. So you put your money in there, you you let it ride, it'll go up and down. But eventually, over 20 years, uh, that because the economy grows and you get the dividends and all that stuff, uh, then over the long term, you'll make money. Again, and I, I want to be clear, I don't have a penny of my own money at risk on that strategy. Okay, you asked me where the starting point was, and I explained that that's the correct starting point and that's the correct place for people to begin because that's the foundation upon which more advanced strategies are built. That's a foundation that you have to understand in order to learn to walk and then run. That's the crawl stage. Okay, but so it, is a, it, it is valid and it is the starting point. Cool. So, so that's the crawl stage. That's the starting point. And then, once we'll get a handle on that, where should they be uh, then looking in, into? Um, you know, it's gonna. I mean, probably we've already overwhelmed people, Robert, with the stuff I've already shared for the crawl stage. Um, you know, I have whole courses on advanced investment strategy, and if we go into it, it's just you know, it takes a course to develop the concepts properly. Okay. And so I'm concerned about trying to do it. I'm not trying to uh, be cagey or elude you. It's just that um, I don't want to confuse the listener and just leave them dropping off because it takes it takes something to really develop it properly. Well, fair enough. Well, then in, in that case, um, well, let's switch gears a little bit and then, and talk about some of those courses. So you, you have uh, these different courses that, that can help people. So can you tell us about uh, you know what some of those courses are and what they're all about? Yeah, the course that's publicly available right now is all about how to develop your wealth strategy. So it's about how to design your life so that your daily actions result in wealth. So it's it's basically how I opened this interview, right? I said, hey, I had this crazy idea. As long as I'm going to lead an economic life, I may as well design it to result in financial independence. And it works. And so then I've replicated that with my coaching clients over the years, and I've turned it into a repeatable process, which is now in a course format. And that's the one that you can buy now. That's my step three of seven steps to seven figures. So I have eventually I'll have seven courses, each teaching an essential part of the wealth building journey. And only one is available to the public right now, which is the step three, which is designing your wealth plan. Cool. And where uh, can people be going as they're listening to this podcast right now? Where should they go to read all about that uh, that step three, that seven, that's that the wealth plan for seven steps to seven figures? They can go to financialmentor.com forward slash three. So financialmentor.com forward slash three. Cool. And once they're on that page, I mean, what are they going to see exactly? They're going to see a sales letter for a course, and it's going to explain the premise of the course, and they'll be able to learn more. But then, you know, they can go ahead and peck around the rest of the site and decide if I'm really legit or not, and if I really know what I'm talking about or not. There's, I have a lot, I have my own podcast, and so there's podcast episodes they can listen to where we analyze a lot of subjects. They can read through the content on the site. I've got, you know, over a thousand printed pages of content on the website, all for free. So there's a ton of free resources on the website that they can go through and just decide if it's really, you know, a fair and legitimate thing or not. Awesome. I'm clicking around the site uh, right now, and and you're right. There's lots of cool stuff. There's uh, there's all kinds of, of podcasts. Uh, interviews and all kinds of written materials and so great so uh, so financialmentor.com forward slash three and is there any other place that you want people to go today Todd or is financialmentor.com slash three the place to be 
Financialmentor.com uh, slash three is the sales letter for the course. And then just Financialmentor.com, there is different places where you can subscribe. And again, if you subscribe, you get a free book from me, a free ebook. Um, it's called 18 Essential Lessons of a Self-Made Millionaire. So it's more free education. And then I have a free course I give away. It's uh, 52 Weeks to Financial Freedom. And no, you won't get financially independent in 52 weeks. It's not, you know, one year to get rich. Um, but what it is in one year, you'll have the framework. You'll know the path that everybody goes through in order to build wealth and become financially independent. And so that's a, a free course that goes on. It, it shows the overview of all the other courses so people understand the journey if, they, if they're interested in taking it. And again, that's all free. Awesome. So lots of good stuff there. And, and I think that this is one of the, those subjects where, I mean, there is a lot to – to sort of absorb there's a lot of terms a lot of things to understand but i think that and i think that you think too that like ev everyone needs to to know some of this because i mean this is your this is your money this is your life this is your, your future and all that good stuff and so i mean if you could sort of if you could uh have a time machine and talk to your your past self you know 10 years ago 20 years ago uh to sort of uh help your past self avoid the mistakes or or do better i mean is there anything that you'd tell your past self if you could yeah, I probably would have bought more more long term real estate. I think that's one of the one of the few investment mistakes that I made was I didn't acquire more real estate very young and just hold it long term. Um, I think that's a, a really smart strategy for people to implement. It's a very it's a very simple and intuitive way to become financially independent. Um, and of course, there's specific rules and strategies for how you do it properly, but it's it's a it's a very straightforward path. Um, so I think that was one thing I didn't do. I did it the hard way. I did it in paper assets, you know, like you said, using statistical and risk, you know, risk management. And it, I mean, it worked and, and I'm very thankful for it, but it's a much more complicated path than uh, some of the more straightforward paths. And then as you teach too, business entrepreneurship, great path. I've done that my whole life. Totally advocate that. Awesome. And so, I mean, the, the big takeaway that I, I'm getting out of our conversation here is that there are multiple ways to make money and a lot of people have already, I mean, everyone's already taken the path that, that most people are looking to already take. They've already blazed the trail for you. So whether uh, you're out there looking to make money from real estate, from a business or from paper assets, uh, it, it can be complicated if you want to take that route. It can be simple and long term if you want to take that route as well. So everyone go to financialmentor.com forward slash three and check out the course that's on that page as well as the podcast and other cool stuff on the various tabs on the website so thanks so much todd for stopping by the show and sharing your expertise in this area i appreciate you i appreciate uh your knowledge and your wisdom and all the cool stuff you, you dropped on us so thanks so much hey thanks for having me on the show robert hope it was helpful this is robert plank and would you like to be a guest on the program? Do you have an idea for a future episode? Or do you just want to tell us how we're doing? Get in touch with us right now at robertplank.com slash ask to let us know.